As I anticipated today, I wondered who would fill this spacious or at least half, half fill this spacious room. I imagine you make up three different groups of people. See if you can find yourself in one. Group one, it's a beautiful-ish day in a, in a New England way today. So you might be people that actually prefer the piles of snow of winter or the torrents of rain, April showers that we've had in the past few days to the warm-ish weather that's outside, right? So maybe you came in as a protection against the elements outside. Or maybe you're part of a second group. Only two weeks of classes remain and this last convoca convocation is entitled Last Lecture. You own a special Fitbit. Instead of counting steps, I imagine that yours counts lectures attended. I imagine you bounding out of bed this morning, maybe you even skipped breakfast, motivated by the thought, I can get in just one more lecture this semester. Finally, group three, you might be the strangest among us, stranger even than those who just really love lectures. You come after a sleepless week, maybe ceaselessly debating with friends and captivated by hashtag last lecture. Maybe you even asked your professor for an extension on a paper, all because you were consumed with the loftiest question of all, who, who might this mysterious last lecturer be? Which group are you in? Or maybe some suggest to me that there's another group, surely the fewest among you. You need just a few more Christian life and worship credits and you don't think you can get them all on symposium day. <laughs> I know you'd rather be outside in the warm er weather or at Bennett counting steps, not lectures or finishing the paper that you actually did not get approved to have that extension on. Don't worry, you're not alone. I too would prefer to be elsewhere today. May I be honest with you? It's an honor for me to be chosen by the senior class to deliver this last lecture. And it's also rather overwhelming. You see, I know something about the class of 2017. I've read your blogs articles, your signs, your posts, your tweets. I've listened to you for many hours as we walked around campus, as you sat in my office, as we had coffee over lunch. And I claim to know something of you because I've listened and I've heard and because I too have journeyed through these last four years with you. Although there is so much to celebrate class of 2017. And I do pray that you spend these remaining weeks with us looking at what there is to celebrate. I know that it's also important for us to acknowledge that there's been some potholes along the way. Here's where this gets a little uncomfortable for me because as Emery so beautifully said, If you ask any student who's had a course with me, no matter what subject we're studying, it all comes back to one theme and sometimes annoyingly so comes back to the same theme, community. So seniors, thank you for honoring me with the privilege of this last lecture. And I can only assume that community is the topic to which you want me to address. Gulp. So let's start with the easy part. Why am I all about community? Because I dropped a page on the floor and my students that take expository communication are saying she told us not to have so many pages. <laughs> I spent 10 years of my life researching, writing, and seeking to address a problem that's facing the Christian church. We live in an unprecedented moment in history. According to a 2014 Pew Research report, when Americans are asked to check a box 
to reflect what is their religious affiliation. They are more likely than ever before, and especially if they are millennials, to choose unaffiliated. These are the so-called nuns that are in the headlines of our news feeds. Religious, unaffili religious affiliation, I choose none. In addition, there's an increased number of those among us, especially millennials, who say they are spiritual but not religious, a newly created term. People are willing to say, I claim spirituality, but religious institution, none. There are certainly many factors contributing to this dramatic shift. Much of the commentary you will read will address the sociocultural influences on American religiosity, and you need to pay attention to these. But I'd like to take a moment of self-reflection to ask how we, the church, have contributed to this. My analysis goes something like this. If you pick up an introduction on the church, you will find outlined two misunderstandings. The church, number one, the church is not a building. The church is a people. The church, number two, is not an institution. Our loyalty is to Christ, not to an organization we call church. I propose, in the time in which we live, that we need to add a third misunderstanding. The church is not a service provider. If it were, the purpose of the church would be to support individual faith. The church is then reduced to a mere tool for personal discipleship. A good church is measured by the amount of spiritual satisfaction we gain. This service provider mentality or misunderstanding gains momentum in a consumer culture. A hundred years ago, the most common word used to describe an American was citizen. And today, it's consumer. You and I are not immune. There is no room for some pious Christian response here. We are well-trained consumers. Consuming is a condition. It's an, like an epistemological lens through which we look and interpret both life and faith. We swim in a world where me is actually supposed to be the subject of every sentence. The well-intentioned church, the people of God, not a building, not an institution, the well-intentioned church adapts to the demands of the consumer. And when this happens, the gospel is often reduced to a story about personal encounter with Christ. And sanctification is about individual growth. Pause. It's true that the church is supposed to support my personal faith, right? Yes, it is true, but it's a partial truth. When my daughter was two, we took her to the ocean and she fearlessly stood in front of those ocean waves. She stood before them with determination. She dared them to topple down and she laughed with joy as they met that challenge time and time again. At age three, we went back to those same waves, but she resisted. She apprehensively played around the surf's edge. She clung to her boogie board and she peered nervously into the dark ocean waters. What changed between your two and your three? You see, my daughter, between those ocean visits, saw a picture of a seahorse. She knew two words, sea and horse. And she put the two together in her imagination, filling in the blank. That ocean was teeming with galloping mares. My daughter, who actually was right to stay out of those waters, she had partial knowledge, enough to make sense of the words, to create meaning, but her understanding was partial. The result was a distortion of what was true, even though it was based on something that was partially true. So it is with our vision for the church. 
that it should support individual faith, personal faith, it's true. But it's only partially true. And it can lead to a misunderstanding and isolation that the purpose of the church is only to support individual faith. How might we expand our vision? In the wake of America's re changing religious landscape and the deep waters of consumerism, we, Christ's people, need to make a confession. We have forgotten to include in our actions, in our messages, in our priorities, that a Christian is always plural. Said differently, a Christian does not exist in isolation. Christians always, 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 always have a shared identity. We are Christians, plural. The word frequently translated church in the New Testament is ecclesia. It's an important and likely intentional word chosen by the New Testament authors because it ties the early churches to Israel. Ecclesia is the same word used in the Greek Septuagint to translate the Hebrew word kahal, which describes those gathered and assembled by God. You see, ecclesia, to describe the church, is connecting us to Israel, but not limiting, limiting us to one ethnicity. It's an assembled people who gather only by God's initiative and therefore exist only as a people belonging to God. Salvation history includes God assembling a covenant people who have a shared identity. This means that me, Christian, doesn't actually exist. When the church is a service provider, I imagine it looks like this. A single person connected to God. The purpose of the Christian community then is to tune them in, to help them select their playlist, and to amplify this connection. And if the church is a service provider, then that means the community looks like this. Miroslav Volf says, one cannot have a self-enclosed communion with God, a foursome, as it were, for a Christian God is not a private deity. Did you hear that? A Christian God is not a private deity. Communion with God is once also communion with those who have entrusted themselves to the same God. We, Christians, always have a shared identity. A Christian exists because we are a people belonging to God. Think of it this way. An Olympian exists because there are Olympic Games. A president exists because there's a country or company. Wally exists because there's a Boston Red Sox team. Sorry, Yankee friends. A Christian exists, therefore, because there is an ecclesia of God. We are a community. That's why I'm all about community. And I fear we have forgotten that core message. Let's not be foolish. To say that we're a community only makes our differences and our dissensions more glaring. To say we are a community is not just to put our arms around each other and imagine that in some weird spiritual sense we are one. To be a community is a hard choice. Living apart from community with the like-minded is actually much easier. To live in community is to commit to being together where, in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we commit to encountering differing wills. This isn't just about who likes stir fry or sushi or who unwinds watching Netflix, binging on Netflix versus eating ice cream. I'm all about the ice cream. Christian community is not the fellowship of sameness, but always difference, which will result 
in conflict. And I've said nothing about sin so far. Add this to the mix. And we are, as I hear you say, and maybe not the best term, a hot mess. I hope hearing the word community makes you squirm like it makes me squirm. Because as soon as we declare ourselves a community, we fail. The New Testament authors are not satisfied with the declaration that we just have a shared identity. I suspect almost all of you in this room have either had Dr. Hunt, Dr. Hart Darko, Dr. Hildebrandt, and please don't forget Dr. Green. He's blessing our heart even right now. It's all about Dr. Green. Love that. But I know all of them have told you to pay attention in the text when Paul uses the word therefore. It's like this giant flag that Paul is waving trying to get our attention as the letter shifts from what is proclaimed about Christ towards our responsibility of putting into practice the implications of Christ. Meaning the gospel has ethical implications. When we read the church is a body or one in spirit or a people, the therefores point to the implications of how we should act. Romans 12, therefore, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. Colossians 3, therefore, you are being raised with Christ. Take off these vices and put on these virtues. The declaration exists. We are Christians. We have a shared identity. Therefore, we're called to be a people, a body that values all its members, a temple of the Holy Spirit. That one makes me really get anxious. A place where God might dwell, not in the singular, in the plural, in the body. We are called to be a sign which points past us and toward God's redemption in our midst. Yet to be a sign, we better be an authentic sign. Being a community is essential. In order to be in community, it's essential that we learn to practice being a community. Why do we claim spiritual but not religious? Why do we choose none, the unaffiliated? Because we're tired of looking at the church. We're tired of looking at untransformed people. Now don't get me wrong, we will not move to perfection. That day will not be until the consummation of all things. But there's a breaking in of the Spirit of God that calls us to be transformed. Today I want to offer three practices to us that are community forming, not just personally forming, community forming. We're going to turn to Galatians chapter 5 in a study of the fruit of the Spirit, if you will turn to that passage with me today. The author of Galatians seeks to resolve a conflict in some of the early churches. Clearly, community is a perpetual problem. There are some among them who are strongly advocating that the Gentiles must continue following the Jewish law, such as being circumcised. They did this with good intent because they saw the law as a mean of, means of eradicating sin. Their very identity understood themselves as part of a, these covenant promises that were bound to the law. But the author declares this to be a perversion of the gospel. Why? Because in Christ, we experience liberty, freedom from the law and should focus on the original intent of the law, to love one another. This liberty or this freedom is realized in community and there are practical implications here. Christ's liberating power should result in changed social relationships. We hear that echoed in chapter 3, 26 through 28, 
where we see these, the call to transform relationships, that the ethnic, ethnic division admits the Jews and the Gentiles should change, that the economic or social separation between should be eradicated between slave and free, that the gender inequalities among males and females should not exist not in their standing before Christ, but in their standing before each other. Against this relational background, we hear Galatians chapter 5. What the flesh produces, what the spirit produces. The author employs a cosmic vision of a battle between the flesh, our sinful state, and the spirit. And the cross is a liberating event that resolves this battle by breaking the powerful sources that hold humanity captive. This is a cross that frees us not to be autonomous from each other. This is a cross that liberates us so that we can overcome our disruptive behavior that has an impact on our social relationships. There are two lists here, two lists here, and they're both talking about what the flesh or the spirit generate. The flesh versus the spirit. The acts of the flesh are those characteristics that destroy community. Sexual immorality, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, and factions among groups. The spirit generates fruit, which is life-giving and nutrient-rich for the community. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep stepped with the Spirit. So please make note in this passage that we actually do not produce the fruit. The Spirit produces the fruit. And this is important because the Spirit does not coerce or force us. We retain our agency. And you and I are invited to participate in the spirit that we might keep in step with the spirit. Maybe you've driven into Newburyport or Boston and you've seen these massive windmills dominating the landscape. I'm always struck by how slowly they are moving. My physics engineering students in here, please note I'm not a scientist. I am a theologian. Interpret this as such. What I don't know, the omniscient Google does, or maybe I should have asked David Lee, one and the same. I've learned two things about windmills. One, those blades are angled. Two, the surface of the blade is uneven so that it disrupts the wind's motion. The blades are designed to receive the wind. In addition, there's an internal mechanism of turning gears, and these gears harness the wind and create a faster motion, right? Which generates the energy, the power. Relationships have the potential to be like windmills, harnessing the Spirit's power to generate fruit, which will nourish our community. We don't produce it, the Spirit produces it, but it is the otherness or the differences and the conflicts among us that act like the angles and more, the uneven surfaces of the blade. It is our conflicts, our difference, our differing wills that are the uneven surfaces of the blade. They are the avenue of the possibility of community. That makes no sense. From death to life. But the spirit does not coerce. When we lean into the power of the spirit, when we angle ourselves and our relationships, when we take our rough surfaces and we turn them toward the Spirit, we join the Spirit's efforts who, like the turning gears, generates power, which does more than we can generate ourselves. The Spirit produces 
what nourishes community. So how might we angle our rough surfaces toward the spirit? May I suggest three practices. Practice one, curiosity. Curiosity generates forbearance or patience, forbearance to bear with one another, to be patient. It's my first week of classes, my freshman year at Gordon College. I live on the third floor of Frerin. Dr. Wilson is my Old Testament professor. Where you pass by Chase, I pass by Shepherd, which is an all-girls dorm. Yes, sometimes called the nunnery. <laughs> I've just met my roommate. The two of us cling to each other trying to figure out this place called Gordo. A couple of guys asked us to go for a walk one night and I'm excited because I had read in these brilliantly glossy brochures, I'd read about this at campus's extensive acreage, but I hadn't wandered yet off the main campus. So we start into the woods and we walk and we walk and we walk. We walk until we end up at a large ravine, i.e. we are no longer on campus although I did not know. One of the guys pulled out a container of lighter fluid while the other gathers a huge pile of leaves. Yep. A huge blaze shoots upward, lighting up the darkness. How could it be that at that exact moment, across the ravine, a very kind policeman saw the little light, I'm sure it was small, gets out of his car, shines his light, yells at us, these two surely very nice gentlemen, grab my friend and I, and we're hiding in the bushes. Shh, don't tell anybody the story, by the way. There we sit. He comes out, he's calling to us, he's shining his light, and you know what we did? Figure Adam and Eve did it, right? We hid for a long time. And then he left. And the whole time I'm thinking, oh my gosh, my parents have left me at Gordon College and now they're going to get a call and going to end up in jail. But he left. So we get up and we walk out of the woods where we met him on the path. <laughs> it's my first week of Gordon and I'm sitting in the dean's office, rather terrified, when I hear this. Sharon, tell me what happened. Tell me what happened? That's not what I anticipated. I was hiding in the bushes from the policeman. There was a fire, right? Tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. That was the first question. He was curious about what was behind my poor actions. Don't mishear me. I was still responsible for the fire and the hiding, right? But he was curious, which opened up the opportunity for our conversation. And I just turned into like this marshmallow weeping thing. I, we were high, I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't know we on campus, I don't know. But that opportunity, the curiosity, Sharon, tell me what happened. It opened up some space. Patience is essential in community. We act in ways that disappoint. We react to each other without thinking. We project feelings and experiences on each other. Patience is essential in community. Practicing curiosity means seeing or trying to see what is behind the action. What are the reasons this person is hiding in the bushes and started a fire? This is more than just giving a person the benefit of the doubt. Maybe there's something we can learn here from the field of positive psychology. Curiosity starts with two affirmations. One, you, me, overreact, the one who overreacts, disappoints, projects your stuff on each other, are doing the best you can with the knowledge, capacity, and resources that you have at that time. Number two, you, who overreacts, disappoints, projects your stuff on me, can do better. You're doing your best and you can do better. Practicing curiosity opens up the space between us for that conversation. The spirit generates patience. Patience is needed because sometimes we can only see part from our view. Patience is needed because those who you look up to are gonna disappoint you. 
Patience is needed because those whom you wish to lead will not always follow. I am going to disappoint you. When you haven't turned in your work, for your assignments that are due, I'm going to judge that. I'm going to judge it by a generalization. That you're playing too many video games, that you don't have your priorities straight. And that's where I am with you. Until, which I not always am, I'm curious to hear the larger story. To assume the person is doing the best they can. You're going to disappoint me. Sometimes you're actually playing too many video games, right? We're going to disappoint each other. But can we start with a curiosity of the question? You're doing your best. You even knew you could do better. And let's have a conversation. When we practice curiosity, we angle our rough edged relationship blades towards the wind of the spirit who generates what is difficult to produce ourselves, patience. Might we practice curiosity? Number two, practice fasting. Look with me at Paul's emphasis on liberty and freedom from the law in this passage in Galatians 5, because there is a caution. Verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. You see, our liberty in Christ is intended for the building of the body, not for self-gratification. Our liberty in Christ is intended for the building of the body, not for our self-gratification. Among this list of what the flesh produces in Galatians 5 is a listing of excessive self-indulgent behaviors, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, drunkenness. This is contrasted with what the spirit produces, self-control. From drunkenness, excessive indulgence, to self-control. Verse 14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Self-indulgence destroys community. Self-control nurtures community. How might we lean into the power of the spirit to angle ourselves? Fasting is a historic practice in the church. Recently, I'm glad to see it's become more part of our community. I see it in its um, most historic expression, fasting without food, but I also see it in fasting from technology. One recognizes our physical need for food, the other our overindulgence through the screen. Fasting makes us pause, go without, or withdraw for a time so that we can turn our attention to God. In Galatians 5, I'd like to imagine Paul calling us to fast from our freedom for a time to weigh whether or not it is self-indulgent. I live in the great state of New Hampshire where the motto is, live free or die. And it's alive and well. As you cross the border on a sunny day, you will see lines of motorcyclists removing their helmets because in New Hampshire, there is no helmet law. I hear the motto loud and clear at this moment, live free or die. My choice, my freedom. The phrase was adopted during the Revolutionary War and was intended to be a firm declaration against England's heavy-handed political control. Yet the phrase in its origin was not intended to be an expression of individualized freedom, get off my lawn, but a community's claim for a collective freedom. Fasting from our freedom for Americans, for a time, allow us to see God and reflect on the freedom that we have in Christ, which intends that we use our freedom to build up the body. The spirit produces self-control. In no way am I claiming that our freedom, that this is our freedom in Christ, in the sense that we are called to give up only. This is not a call for some false Christian humility where Christians should always declare I remove myself or I submit. 
because sometimes our freedom will produce the call to declare or to proclaim loudly. We are called to seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with the Lord, all three together. Fasting itself can become self-indulgent. Fasts are meant to be broken. If you go without food for too long, you will die. The intent is to break away and fast for a time, to go without in order to seek God. Fasting provides this opportunity for us to pause and discern if our good intentions might have implications that do not build up the body. Do we speak or should we be silent? Do we post or should we meet for coffee? Do we sacrifice or do we assert? Fasting allows us to pause, to step back, to weigh our options and to choose our actions. When we practice fasting, we angle our rough-edged relationship blades toward the wind of the spirit who generates what is difficult for us to pursue ourselves, self-control. Self-control builds up the body. Curiosity, fasting, and my third practice, forgiving. I saved the hardest for last. I'm sitting in class last fall, I'm listening to a brilliant presentation on forgiveness by Whistling Augustine, Jacob Jones, and Benji Sucris. They're contrasting a broadly accepted view on forgiveness led by a cultural icon, Oprah Winfrey. She defines forgiveness as letting go to allow, quote, self to move to full presence so we can, quote, embrace now, not hold on to what is in the past. Forgiveness in this sense is about individual health and fulfillment. These students challenge this perspective as an over-individualized and as over-individualized and ineffective. And in their words, quote, it makes no difference in a world full of racism, police brutality, and mass shootings. My eyes fix on the screen as they project the words by Martin Luther King Jr. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. We never get rid of an enemy by meeting hate with hate. We get rid of an enemy by getting rid of enmity. By its very nature, hate destroys and tears down. By its very nature, love creates and builds up. Love transforms by redemptive power. At this point, Jacob Jones concludes saying, and yes, he actually quoted himself on the screen. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> Qu <laughs> Quote, your transgressor's future depends on you forgiving them. These students echo what we read in scripture. Forgiveness is inextricably tied to reconciliation. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew writes of Jesus proclaiming the implications of the law, do not murder, to include prioritizing reconciliation, which by the way begins with a therefore. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has committed something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go, be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Dietrich Bonhoeffer gives a very practical example of how we might practice forgiveness. When your brother or your sister sins against you, before you see that person, you should imagine that Christ stands between you. Seeing Christ immediately produces thankfulness in me because I see what Christ has done for me that I cannot do for myself. And it's only then in Christian community, it's only then that I can look at the person who has caused me this pain and begin to be thankful for what Christ has done for them as well. There's nothing here that waters down sin or reduces the pain or the suffering that's been caused by another. There's nothing here that says that we should ignore or gloss over what we do to each other. The opposite is true. This takes the real effects of sin seriously. How is it 
that in this space, in this place, we might practice forgiveness. We are not a righteous community. We are a forgiven community. Made righteous through the self-giving love of Jesus Christ. This love is still active. The Spirit is still doing things that we cannot do for ourselves. I'll add one piece to your wise words, Jacob Jones. And I'll, put, I'll quote myself up on the screen so it's a little less awkward. Your transgressor's future depends on you forgiving them. And a Christian community's future depends on the practice of forgiveness. When we practice forgiveness, we angle our rough-edged relationship blades toward the wind of the Spirit who can produce love among us. Will you, with me, work to practice curiosity to look behind our first encounter with each other so that our curiosity, the Spirit, might produce more patience among us. Will you, with me, practice fasting from our freedom for a time so that we can discern if it's self-indulgent or if it will build up the community? Not an easy decision. Will you, with me, practice seeing Jesus between us? Our only hope of forgiving, which produces love. I'd like it that in 10 years, when that unaffiliated circle can be filled, that the Christian church has taken a new direction, that we've started to take seriously the call of our shared identity, therefore, and that we might practice what it means to angle the rough edges of ourselves, our differing wills, to the possibilities of the wind of the Spirit. For only there is our hope for Christian community. Class of 2017, thank you. Thank you for having some differing wills amongst us because there's possibility in our rough surfaces because of the love of Jesus Christ and the active power of the Spirit. Thank you.